All right, looks like we're on. My name is Jen Cantwell. I also go by Freddie. Um, I am the Utah Regional Coordinator for She Jumps, which is a national nonprofit whose goal is to get more women to the outdoors through transformative outdoor play. So we're here tonight with the Utah Avalanche Center. We've got Nikki and Hannah that are going to help present the Know Before You Go um, slides. And yeah, so I'm excited to be here again with you two. Um, if you have any questions during the presentation, there is a Q&A specific um, chat box. I believe it's at the bottom. At least that's where it is on my screen. So put any questions in there and we'll get to them at the end. Um, I think that's it for me. I'm going to pass it on to Hannah. Awesome. Thanks so much, Freddie. Hey, everyone. This is Hannah Whitney. I'm the development director for the Utah Avalanche Center. Um, so if you are not as familiar with the UAC, depending on if you found this event through She Jumps or the UAC or through um, different means, um, the Utah Avalanche Center is a nonprofit, and we provide uh, avalanche forecasting, education, and awareness across the state of Utah. Um, our wonderful partners, She Jumps, also a nonprofit, and uh, we like to remind that, um, remind everyone of that as we start off, especially these free events. Just know that we are we are fulfilling our missions as nonprofits by carrying out these events. And if you find yourself in the place um, to, be, to be thinking about charitable giving this time of year, we, we both have year-end campaigns going on and we're looking to, um, to gain donations from community members who have the ability to support us so that we can continue providing both free and affordable services um, to you, our community members. So thanks so much for keeping that in mind. And, um, I'm going to share just a little bit more also about what we have going uh, going on coming up that's a part of our She Jumps and Utah Avalanche Center collaboration. Uh, we've been working together for 10 years, maybe more than 10 years now, but around 10 years doing these kinds of events. Normally, we would be in person uh, at REI here in Salt Lake City. Uh, we miss seeing all of you in person, but hey, if we've got to do it virtually, we'll take it. Um, so some other things that we have coming up, we actually have a rescue clinic that is tomorrow morning uh, up at in the Alta area. So we'll be meeting at the Grizzly Gulch Trailhead at 8 a.m. And we had one spot that opened up. So I went ahead and in the chat box, I put a link to that event. Um, and because of our partnership with She Jumps, we actually have a discounted price available. So the normally $75 course is only 10 bucks. Really good deal. I realize it's super last minute, but if you happen to be free tomorrow and you want to get on snow and practice some of your avalanche rescue skills, um, we would love to have you. So first come, first serve. That link is in the chat. Uh, DEC8 She Jumps is the code to use. And uh, we'd love to have one more person join us. I'm going to shut off registration at 8 p.m. tonight um, just because we need to get email you the information that you need for the morning. So we don't want to have it open too late. So go ahead and sign up for that event if you'd like to join us. Have a number of other awesome events coming up as well. Uh, next week, December 16th and 18th, we have our Women's Backcountry 101 course. That's our first Women's Backcountry 101 of the season. We do have a couple of them, and uh, I think they all have some open slots now. So um, this one, I'm going to go ahead and put a link to our blog into the chat as well. And you'll see there a link to the Women's Backcountry 101 for December 16th and 18th. Um, you can, you can uh, head on over. There's only four spots that opened back up. So go ahead and, and grab one of those spots or grab an, a, a spot for one of our future events. <clears throat> Excuse me. There's another 101 <clears throat> on December 28th and 30th. And uh, one at Powder Mountain in, on January 28th and 29th. The one on the 30th is in the Cottonwood Canyons, um, and you'll be emailed all the additional details uh, as those events approach. <clears throat> How those events work is that you'll have an evening webinar session. You'll actually have materials that you'll be emailed so that you can complete them on your own time. Then we'll have a small webinar session. 
and on the you know the 16th and then your field day is on the 18th so highly recommend that you continue furthering your avalanche education after tonight's presentation by attending one of these courses you just can't be getting on snow um, for these things so let's see i think that that covers it i'm not going to go through every single thing but please go ahead and visit the uac website and the she jumps website um, oh yeah, one more thing. I, uh, I just got my new She Jumps hat. So in addition to making donations this time of year, if you're doing any Christmas shopping, whether you're building your own list or for anyone else, um, both the UAC and She Jumps have online stores and we've got great gear that's for sale. Um, so please consider that as well. Don't forget. Um, but more importantly, let's talk avalanche awareness. I'm excited to introduce the UAC's forecaster, Nikki Champion, who's gonna get us rolling tonight. Um, and yeah, again, to reiterate what Jen said, we will do our best to monitor the Q&A tonight and uh, get to as many of your questions as we can once we wrap things up. Nikki? Awesome, I will start sharing my screen and then I'll do a little introduction and we'll get rolling. So. All right, can everybody see my screen? Hannah, awesome. So uh, like Hannah said, I'm a forecaster here for the Utah Avalanche Center. Uh, my forecast region is the Salt Lake, Provo, and Ogden area mountains, as well as I'm really heavily involved with all the She Jumps women's education. Bummed that we're not doing this in person. It's always a huge event at REI. I think last year we had like 80 women and like two or three boyfriends. So it's always a super fun event. Um, a little bit more about me. Before I came to the Wasatch area mountains, I worked up in the Chugach in Alaska and then in Bozeman for about five years, both locations doing avalanche education and uh, some snow science, research in snow mechanics. And then in the summers, I work as a climbing guide based out of the Pacific Northwest. There I work really closely with She Jumps as well, doing their uh, women's mountaineering and ski mountaineering courses. So awesome organization, always stoked to work with you guys. And uh, we're gonna get going on the know before you go. So, First up, we want to just give a huge thank you to everybody that we work with to put this together. Uh, the UAC, all the other organizations that have helped us put this all together, this um, ever-growing Know Before You Go PowerPoint together in this uh, program. So well, thanks to She Jumps for hosting this. You guys always bring a ton of women and introduce more women to our education, so we're always excited to work with you guys. Just one thing to remember, this is an avalanche awareness program. Um, this is not an avalanche class. Uh, in the mountains, you have to learn about avalanches, but to learn how to stay safe, you do have to take a course. So this is the first stepping stone. Obviously, you guys are all here and you want to learn. Uh, like Hannah said, if you're in the Salt Lake area, we have a ton of awesome opportunities to get on snow and take a field-based avalanche course where you can learn more about the basics of avalanche safety and how to manage your own risk. Sadly, this presentation will not do all that, but it is a great stepping stone or a refresher. So who all needs to know about avalanches? Obviously, there's skiers, snowmobilers, all of the more general people, but there's also extreme snow angelers, snowball fighters, hikers, dog walkers. Everybody needs to know about avalanches. Anybody who spends any time in the mountains in the winter effectively does need to know about avalanches. So if you grew up somewhere near an ocean, you learn about all the kind of tendencies of the ocean. You learn about the tides, the currents, the animals that are lurking under the snow or the water. Um, when you travel into the mountains, you have to learn about avalanches. They're kind of those uh, secret riptides or those underlying currents. It's kind of the basic skills that you have to have to effectively play safely in the mountains. Um, these are the skill sets that you need to build off of to go play. So avalanche fatalities by state since 1950. As you can see, some states do have more avalanche deaths than others, but Avalanches can kill anyone, anywhere in snow-covered mountains. You can see there's even some out east, uh, some in the North Dakotas. So play safe. It affects everybody across the country. And then avalanche fatalities by activity. It doesn't matter what brings you to the mountains, skiing, snowboarding, snowmobiling, snow biking, ski patrol, highway workers, utility workers, anybody who spends time in or around the mountains could be affected by a, a, a fatality. So we all need to know this information moving forward. The good news is that avalanches are seldom random. We often trigger them. 
So who's triggering these avalanches? Well, it's us. Um, about 90% of all avalanche accidents are triggered by either ourselves or somebody in our group. So that's good news because we do have the ability to avoid getting caught in these avalanches or causing these avalanches. Um, beginning your education, taking a course like this or taking a field-based course is a stepping stone that helps us learn more about the snow and avalanches and will help us make good decisions. So we didn't watch the Know Before You Go video. It's available online and on our website. Um, but we're, we're going to kind of talk about what the key points of that message are here. So we're going to first talk about all the things we need to know before we go into the field. And then we're going to talk about what we need to know every single day we go into the field. But we're going to roll back before all that. And first, we're going to talk about what is an avalanche. So the basics, it's, it's snow sliding down a mountainside. From there, we can break it into a couple different categories. Some are more dangerous than others, but an avalanche is snow moving down a slope. There's a lot of different kinds. Generally, there are loose snow avalanches and slab avalanches. And then from there, both of them can either be wet or dry. What that means is you can have a loose wet avalanche or you can have a loose dry avalanche or a wet slab avalanche or a dry slab avalanches. Um, the kind of avalanches that are by far the most problematic and cause the most fatalities are those dry slab avalanches. Those are those cohesive plates of snow. They shatter like a pane of glass uh, when there's a weak layer bef beneath them. That's kind of problem that we're looking for or looking that we'll most likely see moving forward in the winter where we have a dry snow avalanche uh, on top of uh, a weak faceted snow. So where do avalanches occur? There's some areas that are really obvious. Uh, when you look in the lower right part of your screen, you see that big open avalanche terrain. Everybody can tell where that is, but what defines what a potential avalanche is outside of those really evident uh, slope features. If you look in the left, that's, that is also an area of an um, fatal avalanche activity. Uh, it was in Tribble Fork uh, in the Provo area. There's a group of young, six young snowshoers. They're traveling this narrow gully when they triggered a small avalanche. It swept one woman into the bottom of the creek. She's face down for about 40 minutes. Um, so some avalanche terrain is not as big or as obvious and it doesn't have to be steep and gnarly to be risky. Uh, while the size does matter, the ultimate consequence of a slide depends kind of where that takes you. Um, avalanche terrain just needs to be steep enough to slide and have snow. So where do these avalanche activities happen? Uh, most of these avalanche activities happen outside a resort boundary. 12% of avalanche fatalities happen right after leaving a resort boundary. So as soon as you leave that rope line, that exit gate, you know, the top of 999, you're entering backcountry. There's no difference between side country and backcountry. As soon as you cross that line, you're on your own. There's no control work. There's no easy rescue. And you're entering a raw, natural backcountry snowpack. So like I said, the side country is the backcountry. It's, it's all the same. All terrain outside the resort boundaries. There's no resort mitigation. Just because you can see it from the chairlift or a ski run does not mean that you are not in avalanche terrain. So paying attention and knowing that as soon as you leave that area, even if you see other tracks, other people, other people traveling that don't have avalanche gear and don't know that they're traveling into avalanche terrain doesn't mean that it's, it's safer than anywhere that you leave from a trailhead. Um, when you're traveling outside of North America, uh, on piste is marked and off piste is marked. Off piste simply means outside the ski run. Uh, this area, if you're traveling outside North America, is ungroomed, unmarked, and has no avalanche terrain. So if you leave a ski run or an ungroomed run, you're now entering the backcountry. The reason that this terrain is so different as soon as you leave the gates, you enter the side country, the backcountry, or you go anywhere that you did leave from a trailhead, is that ski patrols put in a ton of work to reducing avalanche danger inside the resort. They use explosives, they ski cut, they boot pack. Um, this means that they make, they change the snowpack. It goes from being a natural snowpack with those weak layers that we talk about in our forecast to more of a manufactured snowpack and a, a environment that they can control. As soon as you leave that snowpack, you don't have any of that anymore. 
So like I said earlier, avalanches come in all different sizes and avalanche terrain comes in all different sizes. Some different types of terrain, each with different destructive potential, but each on the screen is an example of avalanche terrain that could kill you. The avalanche risk is similar in each case. Some avalanche terrain doesn't have to be big and obvious, but it doesn't have to be steep or gnarly to be too risky. Um, so if you're looking at these slopes right here, you can see that they kind of vary in obvious avalanche terrain appearance, uh, but what uh, size doesn't matter. What does matter is the steepness of the slope. So it could be a really small slope or it could be a really long 3,000 foot run, but what's uh, the most important is the steepness of the slope. Um, as you can kind of see on this graphic, uh, most avalanches occur between 35 and 50 degrees. The problem is that that's right where the most fun riding is. Uh, slopes less steep than 30 degrees normally don't have enough um, slope angle to run or to slide. And then slopes steeper than uh, 45, 50 degrees normally slough off throughout the season. Um, and don't, they don't really build up enough of a snowpack to create that weak snow and strong snow interface. A black diamond slope at Iskiria is about 35 to 40 degrees, just to give you guys kind of an idea of what a 35 degree slope looks like. As well as not just the steepness of the slope that you're traveling on. There's also slopes that are locally connected to you or above you, which are important. For instance, you could be standing on a 30 degree slope, which would rarely slide on its own, but you could trigger a slide on a locally connected slope that's adjacent or above. So if you're looking at this image in front of us, you can see that gentle 30 degree slope, but you can see a obvious avalanche terrain above it. And then you can see the uh, gentle uh, locally connected terrain below. So if you're on a locally connected slope or traveling below avalanche terrain, you can cause a trigger or a collapse that could propagate onto that steeper terrain and you could trigger an avalanche from above or connected to you. As well, there are some terrain choices that are have larger consequences than other. So when you're traveling, you want to think about what's uh, below you or what type of terrain that you would be potentially carried into if there was an avalanche. So we call these terrain traps. Um, there's gullies and sharp transitions. That's something that could uh, increase the amount of snow that would be buried on top of you. Um, so if it was a relatively shallow avalanche to start, kind of like that one in Triple Fork, but you're carried into a terrain feature that allows a lot of snow to bury up, it's gonna have a larger consequence. Uh, another terrain trap is just traveling through trees. So remember that there's kind of a belief that uh, trees are somewhere safe from avalanche terrain. If the trees are spaced wide enough for you to comfortably ride through, they're no longer an anchor for the snowpack. And at that point, they just kind of become battering rams that you're getting carried through and often lead to a lot of trauma. So don't rely on trees as anchors for your snowpack. If you wanna ride through them, then they're spaced well enough for it to slide. Another obvious uh, terrain trap is cliffs or rocks. Um, we're, we've been talking about this a lot early season. Even a small avalanche could be detrimental in rocky or steep cliffed terrain if you were to get carried over a cliff or just bashed through rocks. And then finally thinking about these really big, um, big huge open avalanche paths. And while they don't have those uh, obvious kind of smaller terrain features that could cause uh, more injury, uh, it does mean that it's a, it's a large connected slope and your chances of triggering a much larger avalanche uh, increase when you increase the slide path. All right, so now a little bit of how these avalanches form. We've got a video. So what happens is the snow builds up um, in a complicated uh, strong and weak layers. So you will get early season snow, it'll fall like we had this year, and then we're gonna get cold nights can you guys hear the video? No. Let's keep going. When I'm walking around in the mountains, I like to think of weak layers like a great white shark lurking just beneath the snow surface. 
you always need to be thinking what's underneath me. Take this cross section of the snowpack. You may be walking in a flat meadow and get the weak layer to collapse, and it might make a really loud noise, but the snow didn't move anywhere. That's a huge red flag. In fact, you just triggered an avalanche. That same snowpack, if you were to tilt it up to say 35 degrees, will slide with deadly effect. All right, so the first video that didn't really have any sound was talking about how the snowpack is made up throughout the year or the season. Um, it's kind of like layers of a cake. Uh, what happens is you'll get snow metamorphism or the weather and the type of snow that falls will create this makeup of strong snow over weak snow. Ideally, um, strong snow under weak snow if we're lucky, but what happens is you might get some early season snow like we did this year and then we get a bunch of cold clear nights and that could drive a process called faceting that makes weak sugary grains. So now you've got weak sugary grains sitting on all the north aspects or wherever you've got snow. And then we might get a mid-season really heavy snow on top of that. So now we've got weak grains under heavy big slab. And then we could get a cold, cold like clear night where we get uh, surface hoar on top of that, like all those little feathers that sit on the snow, and then another big storm. So now you've just got this whole interface of slab with weak layer, slab with weak layer. And that's what's causing us a lot of issues. The snow under us builds up in these complicated layers and not all avalanches are created equal and all storms are different too. Some storms come in light and fluffy, other storms come in with wind, perhaps things clear out like I talked about and they create these weak layers. Um, but it all looks the same when we're walking and riding on top of it. And to really get an idea of what's going on, you've got to uh, put your shovel in the snow and get an idea of what's happening underneath your skis. So. Here's an example of a strong and weak layers. Um, and you had, he had to put his shovel in the ground and look under his feet and dig a hole to see that uh, strong slab on top of a very weak sugary snow. So here's a video of it. So you can see that really strong slab. And then as soon as he gets down to that weak faceted snow, it's like sugar grains. You can't make it into a snowball. It just falls out of his hand. So what do we need to make an avalanche? So there's four important ingredients. Um, you need a slab. You need that weak layer. Uh, and what we talk about it in the forecast every day. You can go investigate it when you're in the backcountry. You can kind of follow weather trends, um, see if they're forming, but you've got to kind of know what's going on under the snow to know if there that, there's that weak layer. As well, you need a slope and it needs to be steeper than 30 degrees um, and ideally less steep than 50 degrees. And then the final thing you need is a trigger. And the trigger is often a skier, or rider, but triggers can also be natural and that can be a really heavy wind load. That can be a lot of rain, that can be a lot of snow. It can be an animal or it can be artificial. It can be explosives. So those are the four things that you need for an, a recipe for an avalanche. So we've learned a little bit about avalanches, um, but now we can learn about what we can do to uh, help mitigate it or you know, give ourselves the best chance. Before we ever go into the field, um, before we ever step foot on snow, uh, there's the two things we can do. The first is getting the gear and then getting the training. So for avalanche fatalities in the US, most people die from asphyxiation, which is just being deprived from oxygen under the snow. Nearly all of the rest of them die from injuries that occur during the avalanche, um, some sort of trauma. Even with the right gear, a quarter of the avalanche victims don't survive the ride. The key takeaway there is don't get caught. So avoid that avalanche terrain, make good decision-making, travel safely in the backcountry, and then ideally you don't have to deal with those, those numbers. If, you know, something went wrong, how long do you really have? If you are buried, you need to help find your friends quickly. If you survive the slide but are buried, you can't get yourself out, um, and without help, you, you will die. So, You've got to remember that avalanche debris sets up like concrete within a second or two. Um, people who have been buried in avalanches, they say they can't even move a finger. So you can't just kind of pop and dig yourself out of the snow. Um, so in phase one, zero to 10 minutes, if you aren't killed from trauma, uh, this is the phase that asphyxiation starts to occur. Chances of survival are pretty good if an airway is established in 10 minutes or less. The second phase is 11 to 21 minutes. 
This is where most people do begin to die from asphyxiation. People, uh, and then phase three, three is people who survive a full burial longer than 20 minutes often have some sort of air pocket um, and it sort of flat lines beyond that long um, number. There are a few lucky individuals who are responsible for the long flat curve. Um, last year up in Alaska, there was a, a just a snowshoer who uh, I think fell and got buried and they, they survived for about 50 minutes um, just under the snowpack and were dug out by another hiker. So if you stumble upon an incident where you don't know how long people are buried, don't just assume that they've been buried for more than those 20 minutes and there's no chance of survival. Still, um, there could be a, an odd situation that they have an air pocket or something. So go look for them. Uh, another key takeaway is this organized rescuers can't get there within that phase one, those first 10 minutes. As a risk, like rescuer, you are, you are the main point. Um, you gotta hurry up and don't give up. So if you uh, get someone out in those first 15 minutes, uh, most, you have the highest chance of survival. What gear can we carry to achieve that uh, successful rescue? So the basic avalanche gear that you have to carry when you're, if you're traveling in the backcountry is a transceiver. And what that does is it both transmits and receives a signal. It's so that you can quickly locate your buried victim um, in a wide area and that you're always transmitting a signal. So if you were to get buried, your partners could quickly find you. Um, all of these um, beacons operate on the same wavelength or the same frequency. So brand to brand, they're all going to communicate effectively. Um, you just want to make sure that you have a modern beacon, that you know how to use your beacon, that you've been checking the batteries and you've been updating the firmware. As well, you're going to need a probe and the probe allows you to precisely locate the buried victim once the transceiver has brought you with in the closest distance that it can on top of the snow. Um, once you effectively get a probe strike, then you need a shovel to dig them out. And what you're looking for in a shovel is something that you can put inside of your backpack um, and that has a metal shovel blade and ideally extends because it, it makes shoveling, which is the hardest part, a lot more efficient. A big thing about all of these pieces is that they are useless without the others. So if you have a probe and a shovel, but not a beacon, there's no way that you're gonna be able to effectively do a rescue. As well, if you only have a beacon and no shovel and probe, there's no way that you're digging through avalanche debris with your hands. And the beacon may only get you within, you know, 2.5 meters, which is a, a huge distance still to be guessing. So you, if you're traveling in the backcountry, you need to have all three essential pieces of gear. On top of that, there is other gear that can increase the odds of you surviving an avalanche. Um, some of those gear that you'll often see is an avalanche airbag pack. Um, I'll talk a lot more about avalanche airbag pack after this, so I'll talk about the other two. Um, the other one is an avalanche. We don't see these as often anymore, but it separates the carbon dioxide you breathe out from the fresh air within the snow that allows you to breathe in. And then a RECO is a rescue reflector that makes you searchable to organize rescue teams. RECO detectors are a part of rescue toolkits for ski patrollers and SARS used for avalanche uh, rescue and if you're missing in the outdoors they're often manufactured in clothing ski boots helmets things like that and now um before we get into trent's video on airbag packs uh the woman who normally presents with me every year uh, pat lambros has put together an awesome video about how she carries all of her essential gear into the backcountry and what else she carries um every day when she's traveling in the backcountry and how she packs her pack and we're gonna show that video now. Just give me one moment, I'll get this sorted. <laughs> Share the right one. Let's get that one right out. <laughs>
and we can't hear it anymore. I think it's because Hannah muted herself. I have sleeves for where my probe goes. So carefully put that in and I've got my handle, snow saw, and the shovel blade, the shovel scoop, excuse me. I also include, because it's thinking about rescue gear and I have the space, I want to make sure I can pull out the shovel handle, the probe quickly if we do engage in some kind of a rescue situation. But because it's thinking about rescue gear, my first aid kit goes way down in the bottom and I don't. It's not going to impact me for pulling out the shovel. And then I have a little splint. Yeah. So the last item I put in my uh, repair section on my pack is the repair kit, which I have a space blanket. I have some um, flagging in case we have to use it, call in a hel helicopter to locate the uh, zone where they need to land. And then a little uh, piece to repair a pole if you break it. So in it goes and I forget about it and I hope I don't have to use it. So now, as we think about packing the pack efficiently, you wanna think about starting from the bottom up and items that I'm not gonna use that often. And um, also my go-to if it gets really, really, really cold. So you have hard shell, soft shell, and then this is my extra layer if I have to give it away to somebody. And sometimes I'm wearing it. So now, Within my pack, I have either a top entry, which I'll do on the top third, and I have the back entry, which has been very useful for my style of skiing. So in goes a soft shell that is a backup. I have extra gloves. I have three sets of gloves. That's just my style. You may only need to do two. One for skiing down, heavy gloves, larger gloves, and the, the medium weight. And then I have my going up gloves. So that's my strategy. So I throw those in. And then I also use a, I have a balaclava. I have an extra ear warmers because I tend to give some out to friends that need some extra equipment. So I find just strategy, stuff them in, cram, cram. That's what you're gonna wanna do. And within my pack, this layer is called the hard shell. And most times I am not starting with it. It's not storming. I might start with it during a storm, but it is also in the bottom third. My, I like to do stuff sacks within for my gear, so basically my, sock, my hard shell, again, jam it in, it's got its place, and away we go. We also need to think about keeping hydrated. So I have my tea, I have my water bottle. And if it's a spring tour, I'm gonna to have a larger size water bottle, but the combination is close to a liter that I wanna be having, because. Generally, we don't drink enough when we're out there during the winter. So you, f you start to, I'm going to zip it up a bit so I can do my jamming technique, as you will see. And you'll, if you have a top loader, which I'll demonstrate, grab your tea, find a spot, jam it in, get your water, find a spot, jam it in, zip up. Now, I'm gonna focus on the top loading because this is where I safely put my goggles. And with my goggles, I have figured out the hat goes, the extra hat and the extra buff, and I'm keeping them protected. Some packs have specific goggle pockets. This one, I could keep my goggles on top, but I feel like I could bang them and I don't wanna damage the goggle. So they, on, on the packing strategy, goes on the top third after my soft shell. And so soft shell goes in, stuff, stuff, stuff. Then goes my goggles 
And then we have to think about lunch. And so I have my lunch pack, in it goes. I zip it, pull it tight, close it off. And now what do I do with this top part? I have little sections where I keep extra food in case of an emergency or if friends are bonking and they don't have enough food. This is not part of my lunch. So the extra food goes in here. I have little side pockets where I carry my straps, vole straps. I've used them. They are great for doing some kind of in the field repair for a boot, a ski or whatever. You want your sunscreen and a good compass. Yes, our phones have compasses and all of those kinds of things, but I like carrying the old reliable compass along with my digital stuff. So I have that in one of my pouches. I also carry, I'm traditional, I love my paper map, but I also use Gaia, I use digital maps too. So the combination is really important. And also this is the Wasatch Backcountry map and um, made by Steve Akalis. And you can also put one on your phone. And so I have those as a backup. I'm also now in our new world of COVID, I am going to carry extra masks because I think that's important. Within my other pouches, this side, I have two side pouches. I carry my Leatherman, I carry some Band-Aids and gloves just so I can get to them because remember my first aid kit's way down below. I love to have my slope inclinometer. I also use my phone for my slope inclinometer. inclinometer. I have a nice scraper and I also have one of these little scouring pads. When you're doing this transition between skins and no skins, and sometimes the glue sticks to the bottom of your ski, just do a little bit of this and your ski can slide. And I also carry some extra wax. It's in one of my little side pouches. And it's gliding wax that I carry. And I also carry wax for glopping onto skins, the wax, and that's in one of the side po pockets. The last item, or an important item that I'm going to be ex using this year is, I have um, a radio, and my partner has a radio, and it attaches on the outside, and the inside base has a specific spot in my pack. My pack also is available to carry my helmet and I have a little um, stretching area to keep it attached. I do, have <clears throat> I do have to admit I am not a helmet user in the backcountry. This is your own prerogative but by all means if you're a helmet user put it on your pack. Now let's talk about what I carry when I do my uh, digging a pit. And I, again, I love to have my little bags to keep everything organized. So I have my um, cord for cutting the um, columns in an ECT, extended column test, and uh, a nice little lens for looking at the crystal, and the crystal card, which is so wonderful and useful, and my brush to brush out and look for the density changes within the layers. So. I, it gets tucked away in its own little, and I recognize by color coding, and it goes into my top pouch, and all is good. And one of the, what I love about this pack is I have two side pouches on the hip belt, and the one left side was the tool area. The right side is my quick energy, sugar, whatever. I have a goo, and sometimes I'll do two because I give one to a friend if they're bonking. I have a little lip goop, and the most important thing is I have Enduralite tablets if I think I need the electrolyte push because of uh, it could be a spring day and it's warmer and the dehydration could be setting in. So basically keep your pack organized, do your system, be methodical, and it, you're gonna have a great day in the back country. <laughs> Awesome. We're going to go back over to Nikki. And just a quick note on, on some of the things that Pat shared. You know, if you don't have all your gear yet, you don't have a pack even that fits as much as hers fits. Um, 
you know, those are all steps to come. So we recommend, you know, signing up for a, a further education course after this one, like we've mentioned, and, and then go into a, you know, a gear shop. One of our partners, like I said, we used to do this presentation at REI, or there's a bunch of local shops that are wonderful, um, Lone Pine Gear Exchange, a whole bunch. And they can tell you about the features of that pack. You know, I do wear a helmet in the back in the backcountry. I've hit my head one too many times. So I have a backpack that has a little, a special attachment that allows you to have your, uh, your helmet on there. So, so much information out there. Back to you, Nikki. Awesome. Yeah, thanks for that, Hannah. So yeah, Pat normally does these in person and it's really great to see the way she packs her pack because it's a question we often get at the end of the talk. But we thought, figured we'd throw it in midway that's everything she carries, but remember those three essential pieces of gear. And now we're going to talk about kind of some recommended pieces of gear. One of those being um, an airbag pack. And uh, here's a video of the airbag pack. The point of an airbag is that it increases your size. Um, it makes you more buoyant uh, once laminar flow of the avalanche sets in. It's kind of like a giant Dorito in a chip bag. So the big Doritos always float to the top. The little crumbs always go to the bottom. The idea of an airbag pack is you're trying to make yourself the biggest Dorito. So here's the pack. Maybe. You can see um, there's two different types of uh, airbag packs. They can either use a fan or compressed air to inflate a large balloon above your head. Um, an avalanche airbag pack can prevent the burial because sometimes it makes you more likely to float on top of the debris, like I said. Uh, here's an example of that happening. So you can see that he lost his sled and pulls his airbag pack. It doesn't look quite as big in this slide, but inflates and has allowed him to stay on top of the debris and keeps him from getting buried underneath the debris, or at least ideally with a, a, an open airway on top of the avalanche. Uh, these are great unless you're in one of those terrain traps that I talked about where you could hit a tree, go over the cliff, or you miss the grab for your trigger. So if you do have an airbag pack, make sure that you know how to turn it on, know how to use it, check it every year, and practice grabbing the trigger. So the use of an airbag pack could save about half the lives of those who would have otherwise been killed in a serious avalanche accident. Safety gear is essential, but won't always save you. It's far better to not get caught and avoid avalanches altogether. So for those involved in a serious avalanche, a medium or large avalanche, research shows that an airbag pack could save half those lives. Um, the good news, they work. The bad news is they don't work all the time. So remember one out of four people are killed by trauma. So no equipment is gonna necessarily help them in those situations. Um, for the rest, Airbags don't work very well for deep burials in terrain traps. Um, so if you got knocked over a cliff or you were swept into one of those terrain traps in which you were on top of the snow surface until it compiled on top of you, um, or a secondary avalanche, or if the victim did not uh, travel far enough in an avalanche path for the immersion or to kind of float to the top. So avalanche airbag packs are a great addition but they are not a substitute for a shovel, beacon, or probe. Those are the three pieces of equipment that will save your life. And an airbag pack is just something to add on top of that once you've honed in your skills with those three pieces and you're looking for something else to add to the, to the kit. So say you don't have a transceiver. Um, very few people completely buried without a transceiver are recovered alive. Um, Without rescue gear, it's nearly impossible to find your buried partner. It's more or less like finding a needle in a haystack. There are situations in which uh, this happens, say inside of a ski resort, and there they are trained to do rescues without a beacon. And there are ways that you can do that, such as a um, probe line. Um, if this were to happen in the backcountry and you stumbled upon an accident in which you don't know if the people had a beacon. Um, the best thing you can go do from there is to look for clues on top of the surface. That could be a glove or a pole, a ski, and see if there's a human attached to those uh, clues on top of the surface. And then from there, uh, look for zones that would maybe have the most burial. Well, that could be one of those terrain traps. Um, but like I said, without rescue gear, it's nearly impossible to find a buried partner. 
So carry the rescue gear, it's very important. We talked a little bit about RECO. RECO detectors are a professional rescue tool used by rescue teams. Um, to be found by RECO, one needs the equipment uh, to be equipped with a RECO rescue reflector. Um, what that looks like is helicopter detectors or hand detectors. Um, the only groups that really have these RECO detector receivers to go to find you are organized rescue groups such as ski patrol, search and rescue. And it can be very difficult for these groups to reach an accident within those critical 15 minutes of survival. So do not rely on a RECO detector. A RECO detector is no replacement for a uh, avalanche transceiver. And on that same note, uh, organized rescue and dogs are great, but they're usually too late to the backcountry um, to make those 15 minutes. So in the backcountry, you are your own rescue team. Um, sometimes an avalanche uh, rescue group can't come at all. Um, there's situations in which uh, they can arrive quickly when the weather is great or you're in an area which a helicopter can safely land, but if the weather changes or you're in an area that they cannot get to you, um, you have to be your own rescue team first. So don't be relying on uh, organized rescue as, you know, your plan A of getting out or getting out safely or if something does happen, that's what you're relying on. You want to be your own rescue team and uh, the way that you do that is practicing. So using all this gear can be really complicated and a rescue is stressful. Uh, you need to practice and get educated. So practicing these skills over and over and over again. Many areas have transceiver parks. Most pros practice their searches at uh, once per week, um, those who work professionally in it. And everybody practices uh, at least early season. Um, so a real life situation is scary, stressful, and confusing. And it can happen during harsh conditions. The only way to keep your head in the game and feel dialed with your own skill sets is to uh, practice throughout the season. So when it comes, um, it's muscle memory more than anything. So you can find someone with an avalanche transceiver, but you must know how to use it. So your avalanche transceiver is only as effective as the person using it. So practice with your gear, know how to um, properly use it. And the best way to do that, or the first starting point is to take a course. So taking an avalanche course is the most effective thing you can do to stay safe in the mountains. Uh, there are many public and private entities that provide avalanche training. For us, uh, you can check the Utah Avalanche Center. We've got our education right there. If you're anywhere else in the country, you can check avalanche.org. ARI provides uh, avalanche courses. American Avalanche Institute provides uh, avalanche courses. And if you're not in America and you're in Canada, you can check avalanche.ca for any local courses there. So outside of what I talked about, like how to use your beacon, um, what else that you're going to learn in avalanche is you're going to learn about the different types of avalanches. We touched on that really briefly, but there's a lot more outside of just the loose and the dry um, kind of clarification or classification. Uh, there are different types of avalanches and different types of avalanche problems. And you'll learn how to deal with those and identify those and what the forecast means when you're reading it. You're also going to learn how to choose terrain based on the snowpack uh, and the weather and the avalanche problem that's going on for the day. So they'll help you break down that forecast and kind of make a trip plan. You're going to learn how to travel in avalanche terrain to mitigate your risk. And this is one of the hardest things to do without mentorship or field practice. So getting out into the backcountry with an instructor, they're going to help you identify that avalanche terrain and identify paths that you can safely travel in to avoid that avalanche terrain. They're also going to talk about decision making, especially as a group. It's something that's challenging and it's got its own problems built in on um, some human factors. So you're going to learn about that. And then from there, you're going to learn what I talked about earlier, how to rescue one or more buried people and how your actions can impact the safety of other groups. So know before you go is not the end of your avalanche education. It's only the beginning. So learning about avalanches makes you safer, more confident and capable and overall just a better partner. So continue your avalanche education after this. So we talked about what you could do before you even went into the backcountry, getting the gear and getting that training. Now we're going to talk about what you can do every single day that you go into the backcountry. The first thing you can do is get the forecast and knowing your resources. So uh, a great resource exists to help people. Um, professional avalanche forecasters 
we work really hard um, doing tests, going to the field, waking up really early, trying to tell you the type of avalanche problem that's going on, where it's safe to travel, where it's dangerous to travel for the day, the clues to look for, and how to avoid these overall hazards. Uh, we like to try to communicate critical avalanche information to the public in the avalanche forecast every single day. It's sort of like reading the daily newspaper for anybody that's going into avalanche train for the winter. So you can find, if you're in Utah, your local forecast on utahavalanchecenter.org. And if you're traveling somewhere else outside of Utah, you can find uh, your local forecast at avalanchecenter.org. The first uh, piece of information that you're gonna get is the avalanche danger scale or the public danger rating for the day. Um, what you wanna know is what's the danger rating for your local advisory. Um, what that's gonna tell you is the likelihood of avalanches. So if, if you can see in extreme, um, natural and human triggered avalanches are certain and the distribution and size that they're going to be in. From there, you're gonna get travel advice that goes hand in hand. So you've got that travel advice, you've got that size and distribution, but what does that mean? So when you see those initial colors, you know, low avalanche danger, it doesn't mean no avalanche danger, but it does mean that it's mostly safe. When you get into that extreme, it's really dangerous. It might be a good day that you just like stay out at home, uh, maybe knit a sweater, drink hot chocolate, stay out of avalanche terrain, like stay away for like, don't even go near avalanche terrain because this is when those big like land gouging uh, avalanches are gonna occur. Now the issue is that um, most avalanches occur in that considerable, most avalanche activities or accidents occur in that moderate to the considerable uh, region. And the reason for that, um, the middle of the road is not a good place. Considerable danger is uh, where most avalanche fatalities happen because it's where the most uncertainty is, um, but it's also when the most people are traveling into the backcountry. So you've got that the most amount of people, the most amount of hazard, and the most amount of uncertainty at that considerable rating, which in the end leads to the most uh, avalanche accidents. In those extreme and high, most people hang out uh, at home, like I said, they stay out of avalanche terrain. And then in low, there's, there's really not that many avalanche accidents. Like I said, it doesn't mean no hazard, but they're less likely. So pay attention, know that most the avalanche fatalities uh, do happen in that moderate to considerable range. Um, and look how high that moderate number is. I think um, people have begun to think that uh, moderate is the new low. Uh, that's not the case. There's still a lot of uncertainty and uh, risk associated with moderate as well. So what does the forecast tell us? So this is a little bit, um, this one's specific to the Utah Avalanche Center, but every uh, avalanche forecast or every avalanche center is going to give you uh, really similar information. Um, the first thing, you're gonna see that bottom line statement and that's what I just talked about. It's gonna be a danger rating assigned to the region as a whole. And then you'll see a um, danger rose that's gonna tell you what aspect and elevation uh, that initial danger rating is at, that low, moderate, high, et cetera. Um, from there, you're gonna get a little bit more information. So underneath the bottom line statement, you're gonna get weather and you're gonna get recent avalanche activities. And that's not on this page, but I think that's really information, good information to look at every single day because that's the building box to avalanche um, information or snowpack information is what's going on with the weather and if there's been any recent avalanches because that's gonna tell you a lot. From there, we're gonna tell you what the problem is for the day. And what we mean by that is like, what's the avalanche problem? So what type of avalanches are you gonna be looking for that day? Where we're gonna be seeing that avalanche? And that's gonna be uh, on the locator rows, or the danger rows. That's gonna tell you what aspects and elevations that problem's located at. Associated with that, you're gonna see the size and likelihood of those avalanches. And then we'll talk about uh, some travel advice, how the weather may affect that, um, where we've been seeing that, and like what you can do for the day. So. Every single day, I think it's important to read the forecast, even if you're not going into the backcountry, make that part of your, like I said, the newspaper for those who travel in the backcountry. Um, for us here in Utah, you can get the daily forecast sent to you in an email. There's an app, there's the website. You can sign up or you can call into the hotline and listen to the avalanche forecast if that's easier for you. But it's something that you should make part of your system every single day so that you're 
building the snowpack, you're following the snowpack. So when you do go into the backcountry, um, you already know what's going on under your skis. You don't even necessarily have to dig into the snow because you've been paying attention all season. All right, so we've got the forecast. Now we're gonna talk about getting the picture. So we, we've been reading the forecast. We know what's going on before we even got into the backcountry. But now when we're in the mountains, we wanna look around. Pay attention to obvious clues. Uh, other tracks on the slope do not mean the slope is safe. Along with our daily avalanche forecast, we need to think for ourselves and make well thought out decisions when we're in the backcountry. So what's the most obvious sign of avalanche danger? What's the biggest picture we can get? I talked about it and why you want to read it every single day. It's avalanches. So natural avalanches, human triggered avalanches, it's a huge red flag and it lets us know that um, there's an obvious avalanche hazard uh, on a similar slope. So like I said, the first big red flag is recent avalanches. So look for avalanches similar to what you're thinking about riding for the day. Um, if you see an avalanche, think do they face the same way or same steepness or elevation of what you were thinking about traveling. If that is the case, maybe it's uh, time to reevaluate your uh, trip plan for the day. Another big red flag is cracking or collapsing. So Trent talked about it a little bit in his video. Uh, if you're seeing cracks or shooting cracks or hearing whoomp, what that's happening is that weak grain or that weak layer is collapsing under the snowpack. If you were on a steeper slope, uh, that would be an avalanche. So listen, cracking and collapsing is a certain sign of instability. Another big red flag is recent wind drifted snow or really strong winds. So strong winds are a big red flag and wind can move snow 10 times more rapidly than snow falling from the sky. Uh, this causes drifting snow to create those really strong slabs that we talked about. So um, you can get a strong over week just within a storm system if you have really strong winds or if you had um, like weak sugary snow like we have right now in the mountains and we get storm and then we get a lot of wind, that's gonna create that really firm strong slab on top of that weak snow. So strong winds happening or recent signs of wind drifted snow is a big red flag. Another large red flag is heavy snowfall or rainfall. And it's pretty in your face. If there's a ton of snow coming down, avalanche hazard is going to increase right away. It's the weight of the new snow, not the depth that creates avalanche hazard. So a little wet snow or a ton of dry snow uh, can pile a bunch of weight on top of a weak layer. And then another one is rapidly rising temperatures. So new snow that rapidly thaws can cause damp or wet avalanches. Um, some signs of instability for these wet snow issues are pinwheels or um, you can kind of see sloughs off of cliff bands often when you see that. And, um, it's time to kind of turn around for the day. This often happens in the spring when we get new snow and then uh, a really sunny bluebird day with high temperatures. And then the final thing is we want to stay out of harm's way in general. So we know how to spot signs of avalanche danger, but how do we get out of harm's way? Uh, every time that you go out, you need to understand the forecast, the avalanche problem, and the travel you'll be in, and then match this to your travel plans. Um, some things that you can do to get out of harm's way. First is uh, travel one at a time. Um, don't hang out anywhere that you could be hit by an avalanche. Uh, if both you and your partner are buried in an avalanche, uh, who the heck's gonna get you out? Um, and this goes for both traveling uphill and traveling downhill. Be thoughtful on where you're traveling while you're skinning uphill and uh, how you're positioning yourself while skiing downhill. Um, even though you might get the, you know, best Instagram photo from the middle of the slope, um, be thoughtful about where you're putting your partners and where you're putting yourself. So what's wrong with these photos? Um, over to the left, a person is crossing a really large open slope, potentially avalanche terrain, um, when there's a really great ridge line uh, right above them to the left that they could be safely ascending that would keep them out of avalanche terrain, keep them off of a slope and give them a, a safe exit plan if they needed it as well. So no reason to put yourself at risk while traveling uphill um, when you could safely evaluate and look at the snow um, from a safe travel uphill. On the slope to the, or the image to the right, you can see that there's a group of folks just all hanging out at the bottom. This group's not spread out um, and they're all hanging out in the runout zone. So don't travel like that. 
Another thing that you want to think about, um, especially as we're increasing users, is consider how your effect, or actions are going to affect others. Uh, we could have a lot of increased use this year, so we all want to come home safe at the end of the day. We all have the same endpoint. We're all going to the backcountry for the same reason. We enjoy the outdoors. So um, we're responsible for our own actions in avalanche terrain. Think about uh, if you're exposing others to risks without their consent. For instance, are there parties below you or above you or on adjacent slopes that could get caught in an avalanche that you triggered? So this year, I think it's really important to communicate with other groups. When you're at the trailhead and you see people heading out, maybe get an idea of what their game plan is and then um, you know, maybe be a little bit more patient this year, communicate maybe more than we would. And uh, we, we all have the same reason we all want to go home. So make sure you're being thoughtful on the way that you're traveling in the backcountry and that you're not putting others at risk. So who should have paid attention to this whole thing? Anybody that skis, rides, snowmobiles, snowshoes, snowball fights. Uh, we all want the same thing. We all want to spend time in the mountains and avalanches are going to affect anybody who's uh, traveling in the winter. So you want to remember these five things that we talked about. Uh, getting the gear, so this essential piece of gear, getting the training. You guys are doing an awesome first step. Getting the forecast, um, making sure that you know how to access your local forecast and know all the parts of it. Getting the picture, so putting it all together and then getting out of harm's way. So. Thank you to all of the folks who made this program possible. And then uh, here's a little bit more uh, information. Here's our website. And then you can get uh, e-learning module covering these really same topics at knowbeforeyougo.org. And uh, now if we have any questions, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. We do have a couple of questions. And if you have any more that you want to ask, feel free to put them in the Q&A section and I'll read them out so that Nikki can answer them. Yeah, so, you can get going. All right. So the first question is, how do you determine the slope angle? Awesome. So uh, there's quite a few ways to determine the slope angle. There's um, apps available that you can carry on your phone. Um, and you'll just kind of put your ski pole on the slope and put the app on top as well. Just having a slope angle on there, kind of old school, a one that you keep in your pocket. Um, BCA makes one. I think a couple other brands make one and it's sort of just like a level, a little level that you keep in your pocket uh, will help you identify the slope angle. Um, you can also get things um, in apps or in maps that have like slope lay or slope angle overlay. Um, so if you use Gaia, you can get a slope angle overlay, um, which I think we have available to anybody watching this. We have a trial. Um, and then if you use like Wasatch Backcountry or the skiing app for local users, uh, there's also a um, overlay on that app that identifies all avalanche terrain. Cool, thanks. Right now we only have one more question. Um, so with how the season has started, it seems the southern faces are mostly melting and will build back up perhaps in a better situation. But would it be smart to assume this season that most north facing or shaded faces may be more prone to slide for the foreseeable future? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, you've been paying attention. Uh, yeah, we got early season snow. And um, since then, we haven't had much snow. And that's driven a process called faceting that weakens all of that snow. Uh, what's going to happen once we get a, the next snowstorm is all of that weak snow is going to become a weak layer on the ground. So any slope that's currently holding snow uh, will most likely become a weak layer. Uh, because we got our early season snow kind of like later in the season than it always happens in Utah, we actually got it like in mid-November, there's still some south faces, um, upper elevation south faces that are also holding some of this weak snow. So for sure we're going to be having a persistent weak problem on um, northerly through easterly um, on mid and upper elevations and just start paying attention now and if you're seeing snow on upper elevation south aspects we could even have a persistent weak layer um, on those aspects as well so, yeah I would be careful it's gonna be a, a tricky problem um, for the foreseeable future um, for us here in Utah All right, those are all of the questions. So if anyone has any other questions, get them in now. Oh, there's one. 
Right. They've taken a few know before you go classes. Would you recommend a 101 class or an AVI 1 class as the next step? Awesome. Um, so those courses, uh, they're different, but do cover similar material. Uh, I think it depends what you want to get out of it and what you're looking to spend financially. Um, the 101 is going to be an evening lecture and a full day in the field with an instructor covering um, primarily uh, companion rescue, um, an introduction to snowpack structure and uh, traveling and identifying avalanche terrain. Um, but it's going to be only one day in the field, but it's a more affordable option and a great stepping stone. Whereas a avalanche level one is going to be a little bit more expensive, but uh, three days of field time covering the same ideas, um, a companion rescue, identifying and traveling an avalanche train and a snowpack structure, but you'll get just a little bit more in depth of each topic. So yeah, it depends what your wallet can afford and what your time commitment is looking for for this year. I think the one one is a great stepping stone before you take your uh, level one. Yeah, so doing them both. Um, I just added in the chat for everyone to see that there's, there's a resources and tutorials page on the UAC website that um, I thought might relate to some of the questions that people have. And actually looks like we have a couple of questions coming into the chat, not the Q&A. Yep. Um, Do you want to read them out or you want me to? Yeah, I'll jump on one. Um, yep. so first one here, Nikki, is uh, could you do a quick definition of leeward and windward aspects on a hill and uh, why it's important to know which side is maybe more safe to ski? Yeah, so um, windward, um, is the direction that the wind is coming from. And um, it's a lot easier when there's graphics, but um, so like say this is the mountain range and the wind comes from this direction. Um, the windward side is going to get stripped and often like carry. And a lot of times the uh, snow will then be deposited on the leeward side. So uh, it's good to know like where the wind's coming from and where it's depositing the snow because leeward aspects are often the ones that um, get deposited wind slabs or have big overhanging cornices. Um, leeward uh, aspects will often look pillowed or um, rounded and uh, that's a sign of wind drifted snow. So I know that um, um, American Avalanche Association has some great, uh, or avalanche.org, has a really great encyclopedia section that has a good image of the leeward versus windward to give for those who are like graphics a little bit better. Awesome. Um, we have another one uh, that I'm going to read off. And Jen, I don't know. We've got a question about the Gaia trial. If you want to, um, if you want yeah. to mention or add the link potentially to the chat. Yeah, and I'm, we're going to send out an, a follow-up email that'll have the Gaia trial. So I'll I'll keep it in that. Perfect, perfect. Um, so the other question that we had pop up is that once a week layer is established, how long is it a week layer? Uh, so that's um, sort of a loaded question. So the process that I talked about faceting that um, has been happening here in the snowpack is driven by uh, those cold clear nights. Um, Trent did an awesome video, if you saw it circulating, where he explains that process of faceting a little bit more. It's when there's a big temperature gradient and the moisture is moving through the snowpack. Um, that's the weakening of the snowpack. Uh, the only way that these now weak grains can become um, safe or rounded is either uh, you need a you need a not a large temperature gradient anymore. And there's a couple ways that can happen. You can just get a ton of snow. Um, that's why the Pacific Northwest often doesn't carry these uh, persistent weak layers as long because they don't have a huge temperature gradient because they have such a deep snowpack that it insulates these layers and it allows them to round and become safe. So for this weak layer um, to go around, we pro go away, we probably need either um, like warmer, consistently warmer temps, so not having a large temperature gradient, um, but we, we need more snow to insulate that weak layer and then um, we, we need to stop seeing avalanche activity on it. So it, it could be a month, it could be three months. It kind of depends what um, the weather does more than just like a time frame. So, yeah. Do we want to do one more? Sure. Oh, I just got two. Let's see how fast they go. 
Um, do you consider an Abbey one to be necessary for going into the backcountry? Is the 101 class enough in the meantime if I plan on getting certified further with an Abbey one? Oh, definitely. And the thing about traveling into the backcountry is um, that you're able to travel in the backcountry and avoid being in avalanche terrain. So if you can identify slopes that are less steep than 30 degrees, um, you can ski a ton of days without even getting into avalanche terrain. So it's a great stepping stone and uh, continue, you know, building your skills, identifying terrain and making safe decisions. Yeah. Um, the last one, uh, does faceting make the less than 30 degree slopes more dangerous too? I think maybe you've kind of spoken to that, but um, if you'll follow up on that. Um, no, not necessarily. It's, uh, it's a weak layer. Um, actually, like the areas that you do see some avalanches less than 30 degrees is normally uh, wet snow avalanches. Um, they're just large and powerful and can sometimes go less than 30 degrees, but um, the only risk that would be associated with faceting to those uh, lower slope angles would be if there's attached or avalanche terrain either attached to it or above it um, because those weak faceted grains do create really large connected avalanches um, that's when you'll see avalanches break a lot above people are those persistent weak layers um, so it could cause um, a lot more like collapse or uh, propagation happening above people in connected terrain so be thoughtful of the terrain you're traveling in if we have a persistent issue Awesome. Excellent. Looks like we cleared out the uh, cleared out the questions. Um, thanks so much to everyone. Do um, you have anything else to wrap up on, Jen? No, I just want to say thank you, and I'll be sending out a follow up email with that Gaia trial as well as some upcoming events that we talked about, and also the She Jumps National events. So that's awesome. it from me. Thanks, Nikki. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Nikki. And and we do we just to just to throw this out there. You know, this is this is our our women's you no know, before you go Abby awareness presentation. Uh, we know that we've got a great mix of folks out there who have joined us, and part of the reason that we've we've collaborated in this way over the past ten years is that everybody learns differently, right? And and there's you know group dynamics come into play. And um, you, you might sometimes be out with a group of all ladies, or maybe you're the token lady, or maybe half and half. And we just want to encourage all of you, whether you're, um, no, no matter your gender, uh, that, that you advance your education in a way that's comfortable to you and that you feel comfortable um, contributing so that, that you can speak up and ask questions and make sure that you have an understanding of um, what, you're, what you're getting. Um, as opposed to always relying on partners. And so we welcome everyone. We encourage you guys down this path. And, um, whether you want to tune into further women's courses um, or some of the other great courses that both She Jumps and the UAC offer. Thank you. All right, I'll go ahead and stop the recording. Thanks everyone for coming. Yeah, thanks everyone. Thank you a bunch.